Father, that's an amazing promise that if we hear your words and believe the one who sent you, we don't ever come into judgment. We have passed from death to life. So I ask now that you would grant to my listeners that they would hear your words, not mine, yours, and believe on the one whom, who sent you, that they might have life and be on the other side of judgment. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. There are three main issues in this text, one of which we dealt with uh, two weeks ago, namely the one regarding the man's healing. He was at the pool of Bethesda. He had been paralyzed for 38 years. Jesus walks among that large multitude of people, and he picks out one man, and he, he heals him. And then he disappears so fast that the man doesn't even know who healed him. And we wonder, what was that about? Why did he heal him if he's just going to vanish? He doesn't even know who healed him. So what can the man learn about Jesus or about the meaning of his own healing? And, and when the Jews ask him, who, who, who told you to carry your bed on the Sabbath and who healed you? He he said, I don't know who did it because he had gotten away because of the crowd. Jesus didn't want to draw attention to the miracle per se, did he? Because what happened next, verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse happened to you. In other words, I'm tracking you down to make sure you understand what I did by the pool. I healed you in order that you might be holy. I healed you that you might be holy. Don't sin anymore. That's what holiness is. I took away your sickness as a step toward taking away your sin. That's what I did. I want you to understand that. So the first main issue in this text has to do with healing and holiness. None of Jesus' miracles was an end in itself. None of his physical healings was an end in itself. They were all called, in this gospel especially, signs. They were pointing to something. And if you miss what they were pointing to, Jesus gets upset. For example, in the next chapter, chapter 6, he feeds 5,000 people with a few loaves and fish. The people know it's a miracle, and they are thrilled with Jesus and his miracle-working power. And here's what Jesus says to them in uh, verse 26. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, this is chapter 6, verse 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, you missed the sign quality of the miracle. You missed it. And he's not happy about that. So to believe in Jesus as a miracle worker doesn't make Jesus happy per se, unless you see what the miracle working is about in the bigger picture. And for the man at Bethesda, it was about his holiness. So he follows him and he says, now I've healed you. Let me take you to the heart of what I'm in the world for. I do intend to take sickness away from the world in due time. But right now, I have come into this world especially to conquer sin and to pay for it at the cross. So holiness is what I'm after in your life, mister. That's issue number one. That was two weeks ago. Second issue, there are three. 
I'll tell you what both of them are, and, and then we'll take them one at a time. The second issue is the relationship between Jesus and his Father, Jesus and God. That's huge in this text. And the third issue, the third issue is the fact that this happened on Sabbath. What does that mean? Why did Jesus choose to do a sickness-removing, sin-removing miracle on Sabbath. Why? So those are the two things we'll focus on today. So let's take number two next. Verse 16. They're persecuting him, Jesus. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus has an answer to that. I'm going to leave aside the Sabbath issue for a moment because Jesus and the Jews leave it aside for a moment. Verse 17, Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Now, when the Jews heard him say that, plus everything else that they were hearing him say, they concluded something that turned their persecution into a plan to kill. They were persecuting him. Now they're intending to kill him. What did they see? What did they hear? Verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Making himself equal with God. Now, the the most important thing for you to see here is not that you understand why they concluded that. In fact, you may think that's an overreaction. All he said was, my father's working and I'm working. Why would you conclude he's making himself equal with God? And, of course, my answer to that is they were there. They were hearing how he said it, what he said, other things that he said, and they were inferring this man is talking as though God is not just a father, but as though he's one with God, essentially one, equal with God. The most important thing for you to see is not that you understand why they said that, but that Jesus let it stand. He didn't say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Don't, 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 don't impute to me a claim to be God. That would be blasphemy. That would be heresy. Don't talk like that. I didn't say that. He didn't say that. He let it stand. In fact, he not only let it stand, he went on and made it obvious and worse. And three, two implications for our life today that flow from from this. So let's do that one at a time. First, the son only does what he sees the father doing. Let's read verse 19 and 20. So Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing. The son can do nothing of his own accord. But only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Now, the most radical and important statement in those two verses is the second half of verse 19. Make sure you see it. It says, Jesus speaking, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. 
That's going way beyond saying, I only do the kinds of things the Father does. Or, I only do what I see the Father doing. This is saying, everything the Father does, I do. Whatever the Father does, the Son does. Father creates the world, Son creates the world. That is a sweeping statement that would put these critics of his, I'm sure, over the edge. You say that I am making myself equal with God? Well, let me say it back to you. Whatever the Father does, I do. I mean, what if you said that? Everything God does, I do. So it's pretty clear. He's not rejecting what they said. He's accepting what they said, and he's giving them more reasons to believe it and get himself killed. So my first observation is that the son acts in perfect synchronization with the Father, because he's equal with the Father, and whatever the Father does, he does. Here's the second one. This one is not as easy to see. I commend it to you. You consider it. I'm arguing now, secondly, that not only does the Son do everything the Father does, but that the Father always acts in perfect harmony with the Son and doesn't go off on his own way, but acts in synchronization with the Son. And I'm basing it on verse 22 and verse 22 doesn't look like it says that, but consider it. Here's what verse 22 says. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. When you read a verse like that, you can't throw away everything you've just read, for example, in verse 19. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Does that mean, then, the Son doesn't do what he sees the Father doing? He judges, and the Father doesn't. So verse 19 is wrong. I don't read the Bible that way. I read verse 19, whatever the Father does, the Son does. And then when I get to verse 22, and it says, the Father judges no man, has given all judgment to the Son, I say, okay, now wait a minute. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? What does the Father judges no man means? Is it an absolute statement? God's not involved in judgment at all. God doesn't judge anybody and then I remember chapter 3, verse 36, where if you don't obey the Son, you remain under the wrath of God, God judging you. So I, I'm not going to absolutize the first half of verse 22 and say God has nothing to do with, with judgment. I'm, I'm going to ask, what do, you, what do you mean the Father judges no man and has given all judgment to the Son? And here's what I think he means. I think he means... The Father judges no one on his own. The Father judges no one by becoming the frontline, historical, decisive point at which people go to the right or go to the left. He gives that to Jesus. He gives that to Jesus. And he says in verse uh, 23, second half of verse 23, Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, what does that mean? That means when I'm determining how to see that people are judged, this is God the Father talking, when I'm determining how to see that people are judged, I don't put myself 
out there for them to respond to directly. I go back and I put my son in front of me and I give all this kind of judgment to the son. There's the son and whatever people make of the son, that they make of me. And I'm, I'm flying in tandem with the son in history. As the son is presented and people honor him, I'm honored. As they dishonor him, I'm dishonored. And he is the, the judging that goes through the world with people being divided on the right and the left by whether they honor him. I think that's the gist of verse 22. I don't judge in the sense that I don't put myself forward as the criterion, as the historical criterion by which people meet it and go to the right or go to the left, go to hell, go to heaven, go to worship, go to blasphemy. Rather, what they make of Jesus decides their destiny. I'm back here endorsing, approving, agreeing, receiving, but he's out there as the decisive historical judgment point. So they're still in harmony with each other, and the son is doing what the father is doing in the sense that they are in perfect agreement with regard to who is being judged as honoring or not honoring God, the Father. So, there are two implications that flow from this, these things that I have just said. The Son in perfect step with the Father and equal with the Father. The Father always in perfect step with the Son, but in the case of judgment, putting His Son at the front cutting edge of the historical criterion of who is saved. Implication number one. This is huge because this is one of the pieces from last Sunday's sermon that was, that was heavy. I don't know if you remember this sentence from last time, or yes, last week. Um, the humblest witness, the humblest witness in the 21st century to Jesus as the only way to God will be accused of arrogance. I said that last week. Now, verse 23, the second half of the verse, implies that in our world, this American world we live in, teeming with pluralism, this is the world we're given, very much like the first century, teeming with pluralism. We live in a world teeming with pluralism and no religion. The new atheism today is so virulent and so aggressive and so popular and the, and the left in its most radical forms of secularism is so prominent that the world we live in compared to the world I grew up in in this country is very different, very different. And we are told in verse 23, whoever honors the Son or dishonors the Son, dishonors the Father. And if they honor Him as Savior and Lord, they know God. And if they don't, they don't know God. Nothing could be more offensive in our day than verse 23b. Nothing is more offensive in our day than to say, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. And keep in mind, he's saying this to Jewish people who totally were devoted to God and didn't know Him or honor Him. He wasn't saying this to pagans. So he was in our setting. <laughs> I, oh, I'd love to tell you stories about a lunch I had with a Jewish person two weeks ago who's been coming on Saturday night and may be a Christian by now. Never in a Christian church before about a month ago. Seeking, seeking. That's why he's pointing them to the sun. We're willing to go to places and die for this. 
The church has always died for this. That's why they get killed. Jesus gets killed for claiming to be equal with God. We get killed for claiming he's the only one who's equal with God, and you have to know him. I haven't done a missionary martyr funeral yet in my 29 years. But I expect to. That's implication number one. Verse 23 in our pluralistic day is very, very dangerous, and you will be accused of arrogance, and please don't accept that accusation. Implication number two is glorious beyond words. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whoever, this is any religion at all, whoever hears my word, believes him who sent me, has eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. <laughs> this is too good to be true. He's not saying merely, you will have eternal life. He's saying, you have it. The life that has come into you through faith in Jesus will never go away. It is eternal. You are an eternally blessed person if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is a reality, a power that is in you now and cannot ever be taken away from you. 